Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we're going to be talking about what if Cuba had become part of the United States? There's a couple different situations in which this could have happened. Probably the very first one would have been the proposed purchase back in 1854. Yes, yeah, back in uh, 1854, there's something called the Austin Manifesto, which was very important at the time. It's not really talked about today, but it was basically this sort of white paper written by, it's not clear who wrote it, it may have been James Buchanan, the future president of the United States, that basically said that the U.S. should buy Cuba in its own natural national interest, and if Spain wouldn't sell it, the U.S. should conquer it. Right. And a lot of this was actually driven by Southern slaveholders wanted another slaveholding state to sort of balance out what they saw as an increase in the number of free states. Right. And this was a point of uh, indignation on the part of both people who didn't want more slavery in the United States and also people in Europe who saw this as like just an insane act of aggression. Oh, yeah. This was this was a big deal. And this caused a lot of damage to the Franklin Pierce administration, which really couldn't take more damage than it already had. So it was, <laughs> right. um, so, um, but what I think it's important about this is that we don't see the U S really succeeding in annexing Cuba at this point, but it's important to show that there had been this interest for a long time in right. acquiring Cuba, that this wasn't seen as just some, you know, some far off foreign conquest that there's a lot of people in the U S who had strong interest in making it part of the United States. And I think a lot of that may have just been from uh, an economic perspective because Cuba is a huge sugar producer, mm-hmm. tobacco, um, you know, it's 90 miles off the coast of Florida. It's not, you know, it's not like you're gallivanting off into the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's right on your doorstep. But I think that where we really want to discuss is a sort of a diversion would come in the 1890s. And obviously, you know, there's a Spanish-American War in 1898. Uh, the U.S. fought Spain and Cuba becomes free. But people forget there's something called the Teller Amendment that was mm-hmm. passed right as the war was beginning. And this Teller Amendment prevented the United States from annexing Cuba. It said if Cuba is freed from Spain, it must become its own country. Why this was passed is various reasons. There's sort of some anti, there's just anti-imperialist sentiment. There's even some people alleging that this was to prevent Cuban sugar from competing with various interests in the United States. Hmm. But um, our, actually, we're going to put our diversion actually the year before 1898 and 1897, where there was actually a standing offer from the United States government to purchase Cuba for $300 million, which is a lot of money for 1897. (laughs) Yeah. There was also an offer to purchase Puerto Rico as well, but we're not going to talk about that. We're just talking about Cuba right here. Yeah, we'll just just discuss Cuba today. But, you know, so we're going to say, let's say the United, that Spain rebuffed this offer in reality, but let's say for some various reasons, Spain in 1897 decides, yeah, we'll we'll take on, we'll take on Cuba. Perhaps like the uh, Austin Manifesto never gets leaked. So all this indignation about, you know, America wanting to buy this stuff and and resorting to force if necessary isn't isn't known in Europe maybe mm-hmm. they're they're more interested to play ball instead of instead of saying no absolutely not yeah sure absolutely so or just for you know various maybe Spain just needs more money or right. remember the Cubans have been fighting a civil war against the Spanish for a while to try and get free and I could sort of see the Spanish you know maybe if something had just gone a little bit differently in the Spanish government someone saying you know what they're offering us $300 million, and they'll take this off our hands for good, give them what they want. But that kind of begs the question, let's say they do it. Let's say Spain assents to it, says, we're going to write on the dotted line, Cuba is yours now. Doesn't America kind of inherit the civil war? Well, yeah, and that's that's a really interesting question, because if you look what happened with the Philippines after the U.S. acquired the Philippines in the Spanish-American War in reality, was they basically inherited the whole Emilio Aguinaldo's... Um, revolution. Right. And they just basically said, you know, they were like, yay, we're free. And then the U.S. was like, no, 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 this is the U.S. territory now. And then they began to fight the U.S. And it took years, it took a few years to put put down in a very brutal fashion. Yeah, horrendous down, losses. Yeah, yeah. Um, very heavy losses and sort of a lot of bad blood there. So there's a potential in Cuba that this could happen as well. I wonder maybe there would be people would be more receptive. I really, I'm really not sure, but I, I'm sure it would not be, it wouldn't be just a cakewalk. They're not, people aren't just gonna be like, yay, great. For a new U.S. state. But I think with time, probably that would have changed. I, I'm not sure, though. 
So let's say that there's a civil war in Cuba and America puts it down somehow. Either mm-hmm. it's really fast or it's a long, bloody conflict, mm-hmm. but but it gets taken care of. Like, mm-hmm. where does the United States move from there? Well, I'm guessing that Cuba would be a territory for at least probably 15 or 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, given that the Philippines was a territory until the 30s and then when we converted it into a, co- a commonwealth. But I'm guessing that Cuba won't become a state until the 1910s or 1920s, probably. So it will, you know, join the United States. Um, but there's going to be some interesting sort of twists on this. Right. Because it's going to be different from all these states that have been admitted out in the American West in the 1800s. Or just for purposes of today, we'll say, let's say they, they try and make it a state. So, you know, it's coming in in the 1920s, let's say, you know, it's now a full, full blown state. But I think what I, I think we we're trying to, I was trying to get more at was sort of the cult, you know, sort of the political and cultural impact. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. Cuba is a very different state than, you know, Arizona was. Oh, yes. If Cuba became part of the United States, it would be like 2% of the population right there. Yeah, just a jump, right off the bat. Right yeah. a jump right there. Not to mention like the, the jumps in population that would come from from the benefits of being part of America, yeah. like better infrastructure and roads. You may have even have Americans settling there. You may have a lot of people you know, exactly. going to live there. You know, the environment and the business interests, I think, would drive that more than anything Absolutely. else. With the sugar and tobacco and yeah. various else. And it sits on very lucrative, you know, you've got an excellent harbor and in uh, Havana and all that. So, Tourism. Yeah. So it, it so the, so I'm, but I, it'd just be interesting to have, cause you have a, and not only is it a, a Hispanic majority state, but you have a very large population of Afro, Afro Cubans. So, you know, sort of maybe, maybe some tensions there with, yeah. with, you know, sort of people in the South or, I, you know, it's, it's sort of uh, interesting, but also, um, is the U S going to get pulled more into Central and South America? That's a good question. Um, if, if there's no revolution in Cuba and when did the revolution happen? Mid to late 1950s. I think it was 1959 when the Batista government was finally toppled. Right. When, when Cuba eventually becomes communist, they become like the axis point for a lot of communist activity in the region. Mm -hmm. If they're part of the United States, that's obviously not going to happen in this case. So you could see maybe like Venezuela, not turning the way it did or or conflicts yeah. in Nicaragua turning out different. Yeah. Well, also, I wonder if just the U.S. would have been even more sort of imperialistic than it already was in the Caribbean. If oh. we've had a successful move into the Caribbean, are we more willing to jump in? But yeah, I think it, it sort of changes the whole calculus because here's a massive, you know, here's a U.S. state that's, that's right, you know, right there. So right. Um, I, I think that also brings up which I think what's the most interesting part of this is as we were thinking out this scenario is sort of what are the international effects here? Right. Okay. Well, I think probably the first one we should talk about is if we purchase Cuba from Spain, there's now no longer any reason to start the Spanish-American War. And if there's no reason to start the Spanish-American War, the United States doesn't get the Philippines for one. Yeah. So the Philippines... Unless we would, buy it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's true. But um, mm-hmm. if, if the Philippines remain Spanish, that that changes a lot of stuff during World War Two, for instance. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, is, does World War Two even look anything like how it looked in reality? I mean, if if the United States isn't right next to Japan, mm-hmm. is Japan as threatened? Does Japan feel like it needs to do Pearl Harbor, does, for instance? Does the U.S. even have Guam? Because remember, Guam was acquired. People forget that Guam was a Spanish island and acquired. So obviously, if the U.S. purchases it. Yeah, maybe you have different, mm-hmm. but without the Philippines being such a massive U.S. base in the Western Pacific, do we have less reason to get drawn in? I mean, this is a very serious question. Yeah, it changes all sorts of things. You know, so let's just say that World War II works out roughly the same way it did for some reason, just <laughs> right. just because it's hard to project. This isn't really the purpose of this podcast is to discuss the Pacific War. But also what I'm talking about, too, is like, let's think of the 1960s. Max, 1962, Cuban Missile Crisis. Absolutely. No, no Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> exactly. I mean, are the Soviets going to be interested in installing nuclear weapons in a different country in South America? Are we going to have the, you know, the Nicaraguan Missile Crisis, the exactly. Venezuelan Missile Crisis or something like that? But I'm guessing in a in a world in which the U.S. is even more heavily invested in the Caribbean, we're going to be even more invested in installing, you know, friendly regimes. Friendly, yes. You know, (laughs) yeah, not so friendly maybe to their people, but... Yeah, maybe dropping some people out of helicopters from time to time. You know, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, sort of that... That sort of so is the Soviet are the Soviets going to compensate for this? Are they going to try and topple other governments? I don't know, but it, I think you know, with Cuba as a U.S. state, you know, the the Caribbean may be even more of an American lake. You sort mm-hmm. of sort of put yeah, it yeah. than than it is and already was. I mean, the U.S. already you know exercised a huge amount of control 
in 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 an influence in Central and South America? Is this even more now so that we even have a we have a better stepping off point? So are we even going to f- acquire further territory? Who knows? And then then there's also some other interesting aspects to this too that don't really get talked about much. But Cuban soldiers were deployed actually a lot by the Castro regime throughout the Cold War. That's absolutely right. And and the big place is Angola in Africa during the 70s and, and late 60s. People don't talk about this, but Cuba had tens of thousands of soldiers on the ground fighting viciously in Angola for the MPLA, the, the leftist Soviet-backed political group that eventually quote unquote won the conflict. But I mean, this conflict is is such a huge and sprawling conflict that it kind of is still going on today in, in, a way, in some yeah. ways. I mean, the only exposure I think people have to this is Black Ops 2. <laughs> That's know? right. Yes. You know, when you played some early missions, you I think you do fight against Cuban soldiers, right? Yes. I mean, I can't yes. remember. It's been a while since I played that yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. You meet Joseph Savimbi. Joseph Savimbi like shakes your hand and says, welcome to the battle or something like that. And you like ride on a truck and yes, shoot a bunch yes, of people. Yes, yes, yes. But I think you fight Cuban soldiers at some point. But the thing is, is that this was they openly were serving in Angola. This was mm-hmm. not like covert. It wasn't like how the Soviets in the in the Korean War would fly Chinese planes, but they'd all they would all pretend like they weren't there. Like Cuban soldiers were very openly serving oh, yeah. as proxies for the Soviets in Angola. So and savage fighting. I mean, as was, well with flamethrowers and napalm yeah, and, and bulldozers and cra- crazy and, yeah. and purging villages of all the old people, like yeah, of just, all the fighting age people. It's, it's, it was insane. Yeah. And this is so there's no satellite, you know, there's no Cuban soldiers. And in that case, so are the Soviets going to send their own troops to Angola? Doubtful. I'm sure they would have found some other proxy to, to have done that for them. You could have even seen a coalition government between UNITA and the MPLA because Savimbi said on many, many times that the only obstacle to peace in this situation is the Cubans, this Cuban colonialism, he called it. Where, um, where like this foreign power was going to take over the country. Uh, maybe that was just a lie. I don't uh, know. It's hard but... to tell. I'm not a, I wouldn't consider either of us to be experts in, on, on Angolan politics. <laughs> right. So. This is very true. But, um, but, um, in this conflict also radiated out into surrounding countries yes. as well, destabilizing the Congo, destabilizing, uh, Zaire. R- yeah. Remember, remember South Africa was deeply involved in Angola. I sent oh, troops absolutely. in. So the uh, South yeah. Africans were fighting with the, Sort of fighting with UNITA, it's hard to tell, but they definitely were fighting against the MPLA mm-hmm. and against the Cubans too, because they supported Namibian rebels who were, because remember, Namibia was under the control of South Africa at this time. That's right. So that's right. It, it really actually, that's sort of an interesting thing that sort of that just like, like without the Angolan civil war, you could see Africa being quite different. Angola might have been a country that just had a couple years of war and it might be a major player today or, yeah. you know, well, they do have a lot of oil. They do. They yeah. do have a lot of very valuable natural resources. Well, it's, I, mean, it's, I think that's, it's hard to think it's hard to project. Because remember it, yeah. the Cuban, the, sorry, the Angolan civil war went on until like 2002, I think, right? Yeah, Something Savimbi like lived until 2002, yeah. fighting a continuous guerrilla war yeah, from yeah. the late 60s so, to like 9-11, basically. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is, is that maybe getting a little off topic, but the point is, is that Cuba, that, that, that this was something that, you know, and also no, um, there'll be no Granada. So no movie Heartbreak Ridge with Clint Eastwood. <laughs> That's um, right. It's a good movie, guys. Uh, people forget about it. But <laughs> they, um, they call in an airstrike with a phone. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. No, they call uh, the, the operating line, the um, operator, and they call up like Fort Bragg and are like, yeah, here are our coordinates. Could you launch an airstrike, please? <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, then there's just a few other sort of, I think, side things. Like, is there going to be Governor Castro? Is Senator Fidel Castro or that, something like that's that? That's a great point. That's a great I mean, point because something a lot of people don't know is that many of these communist guerrillas and, and communist dictators in places like Vietnam and many African countries and Cuba were not necessarily from the beginning communists. A lot of these people were first and foremost nationalists. Mm-hmm. They were interested in their own country. Mm-hmm. And and this whole, like, even though Castro later in life said, I've always been devoted to Marxist-Leninism, like, that's probably not actually true. Yeah. Well, I mean, because remember that the Cuban Revolution, when it didn't really start, it started out as to remove this dictator, Fulgencio Batista. And it wasn't it wasn't like when they won in, I think it was 1959, when Castro f- fully took control that he, he wasn't starting out from day one being like, this is a communist country. I think there was, I think they would certainly to describe him as a left, sort of a leftist leaning 
person is yes. clearly would not be Very without, true. but I don't think communist per se mm. was probably the best way to describe it, but it moved into that and it probably didn't help that the Batista regime had been very heavily supported by the United oh, States. Yeah. So that, so. I think that certainly, that, I mean, that already sort of maybe pushed them a little bit away from the U.S. sphere of influence, but in a world mm. in which Cuba has been a U.S. state. Yeah. Uh, with, you know, with, with all the guarantees of United uh, States yeah, citizenship, yeah, yeah. with so the rule of law, uh, all these things, perhaps an Castro armed insurrection is a, is it, would there, be completely unnecessary. Well, there wouldn't be any. There wouldn't yeah. be any need if there were a full state that has all the benefits of being part of the United States. You know, maybe Castro just pers- does, maybe he pursues a political career. Who not? Maybe he doesn't exist. It's hard to tell. This is hard right, to tell, but right. this is just sort of idle speculation. There's also some other interesting effects. Florida. Because of Cuba being a communist country, there is a massive amount of people that fled, very understandably, fled the country. And many of them, whether it's through the Mariel boat lift or, or just taking whatever improvised watercraft they could get a hold of, go to Florida, set up in Florida, and just live there. Yeah, I mean, Miami is very heavily Cuban, and they very, and the culture, political culture in South Florida, and and, they, and just the general culture itself, like, a lot has been influenced by, by Cubans being there. So, it would be interesting to see without, if Cuba's a full U.S. state, you know, just mm-hmm. running along, doing well, maybe you don't see as big a population. Exactly. I mean, you if know? you, if you, you might not see that many people who are Cuban in Florida, because if you look at the example of Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. Puerto Ricans, part of America, they can go anywhere in America mm-hmm. they want. Where do they go? Many of them go to Florida, but there's a ton of them up in New York. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If they're able to come to this country legally and... Yeah, I mean, and, it's just moving between states. It would, yeah. be, it would be not a big deal. It would be nothing. It, it wouldn't even be a deal. It would just yeah. be normal. It, it would be the exact same as me saying, you know, where do I want to live in America? I, I could want, just choose wherever I wanted yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. There wouldn't be any... Wouldn't be any issues at all with that. So maybe, yeah, we're seeing a different South Florida. Is Florida look, you know, differently than it than it does today? Right. No pit um, bull. No pit bull anymore because of this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Maybe or maybe he's out of Havana. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, also, this is a short thing. The interesting thing too is like all the mob connections down in Cuba back in the yeah you know, prior. But maybe, but actually, that probably wouldn't exist because a lot of that existed because the the sort of the regime and. Yeah, the, the particular Cuba, situation the Batista, that existed. Yeah, with. existed in the time. So maybe not as big a maybe not as big a cash cow there. Also, um, Guantanamo Bay. Oh, maybe not such a big deal. May not even exist. I'm assuming because remember Guantanamo Bay is an excellent nat- natural harbor mm-hmm. um, and an, a very well positioned naval base. So I'm assuming Guantanamo Bay would be a U.S. naval base. But now that it's in a a, a U.S. state. I doubt it's going to be used for the purpose it has been used in reality, that I doubt that they're going to be holding terrorism suspects there. So that Guantanamo Bay may just be another name that you would throw out, like just like MacDill Air Force Base right. or Andrews Air Force Base or Fort Hood or something like that. It just won't have that much. It won't have any notoriety. Mm-hmm. It would just be a naval base. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to say, but we're just saying is that it's doubtful that something like that would break out the same way. And I think the final point, this is sort of interesting if you think about it, is is there as much hostility towards the United States from Central and South American regimes, because sort of I guess how I how we put it is is without Castro, is there is there a Hugo Chavez? Is there an Evo Morales? Is there sort of the a, a sort of are, are there is there as much support for sort of populist populist leftist governments in Latin America that are opposed to the United States? I I, I think that it would make a lot of sense for certain people to be very hostile to the United States. The United States are the big player, mm-hmm. you know, they're the big guy, mm-hmm. and. It makes perfect sense for a lot of people to not like them very much for mm-hmm. for various reasons. Yeah, yeah. If there's no central spoke of Cuba to be operating out of, no, I don't think it would occur under the same circumstances. There's several leaders, clearly people in South, like some of these leftist leaders in South America who've emulated sort of the Castro model in a sense, not totally, mm-hmm. of course. But yeah, so I guess that's just interesting to see. So I think the, the sort of the whole point with this episode was to show that this is this is this change really does seriously impact. It, just, it really does. It just changes a lot. If Cuba is a U.S. state, this isn't just sort of some sort of oh, this one minor change and nothing really. You know, this has this has a lot of sort of rippling effects. Oh, and yeah. there's no there's no embargo and yeah, yeah. various other things. More so. cigars in America yeah, all more of a Cuban sudden. Cigars. Well, now yeah. you can now you know right. with the normalization of of relations but i mean it's still thawing a little bit but you know that won't even no one won't even be you know on the table yeah but. it's not even a talking point anymore and i mean you know matt have you, have you seen any any works of alternate history that deal with uh cuba becoming part of the united states yeah there actually are there's a few that come to mind the first one is actually in the great war series by harry turtledove um which i think we've mentioned before on a previous one where cuba is part of a, a confederacy 
Uh, and it, I've seen several alternate histories where Cuba sort of gets annexed into the Confederacy since it's right there. Um, in the Draca series, too, by S.M. Sterling, uh, Cuba is purchased in 1854 uh, along with the Philippines and Puerto Rico and Guam and, oh, I think, Kauai, too, simultaneously. Mm. So it's a whole bunch of territorial acquisition. So this is not an unknown concept. It's sort of like in several alternate histories, Canada is part of the United States. It's just by virtue of its closeness, Cuba is just... A, a, a good candidate for being annexed. It's not like, you know, you're not going to see many alternate histories in which, you know, Greece it becomes a U.S. state. <laughs> but um, Cuba just makes sense. It's, it's you know, right there. Right, right. Oh, great. Well, I think that's about it for today. So, yeah. so uh, thanks for listening. And this is Matt signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys.